And so, yes, it's my pleasure to introduce Olivia Schiffman from CNRS, who will tell us about Yangians and the cohomological whole algebra Higgs sheaves on curves. And as before, we'll have a 25 minute session, a five minute break, and a 25 minute session, and then questions. All right, thank you very much for the invitation. I hope I get to see some of you very soon uh, in real life. But uh, in the meantime, I will try to entertain you with two dimensional cohomological whole algebras associated to curves. So as you will see, I have already written down everything. Uh, I wrote way too much, but uh, we'll see how it goes. And the first part, which will probably last more than 25 minutes, uh, is just try to give a general picture. What is a koha? Why do we care? What does it look like in, in examples? And then in the second case, I will focus, uh, second part, I will focus on the case of P1. And, and try to be more precise. Okay, so uh, input for a koha is just like for a usual whole algebra. It's an abelian category. And for me, all these categories are going to be related to quivers or curves or maybe surfaces. So the global dimension of this abelian category is going to be one or two. There are many cases of uh, higher dimensional kohas that you want to consider, but uh, I, I will not do it in this talk. Uh, so we assume that this uh, category is nice enough that there's a moduli stack of objects. It may have lots of connected components according to the Grotten de group. And then the, the main point of having an abelian category is that you can consider this Hecke stack. So Hecke stack is the stack that parameterizes all short exact sequences. And uh, you can use it to define some kind of uh, algebra structure on M. More precisely, you define some kind of convolution diagram uh, where you have uh, M cross M on one side, M on the other side, and this Hecke stack in the middle. And the maps, uh, which I denote Q and P, are simply obtained by forgetting either the middle guy or the two extreme guys. So if you look at the fiber of Q, it looks like some uh, X stack over the pair M, M double prime, M prime. Uh, or more precisely, if you're in higher global dimension, it would be some kind of truncation of that. And um, if you look at the other map, so P, then the fibers are quote schemes. Um, okay, so in, in nice examples, Q tends to be kind of smooth, and P is, is proper. So uh, the idea of the game is try to exploit this uh, Hecke stack to construct some actual algebra. Uh, or categories uh, equipped with some monoidal uh, um, structure. Uh, and so how you do this, you would take some you know, invariance or cohomology theories. You can even work directly with categories uh, that you can plug your uh, moduli stacks M into. And then this uh, induction diagram induces some algebra structure on this F of M. Um, so you can run, you can try to run it both ways, either from M cross M to M or from M to M cross M. In this uh, talk, I will only be interested in the algebra, not the co-algebra structure. Usually depending on the cohomology theory, you're considering one is better than the other. Okay, so some old and famous examples of that are the what's usually called whole algebra, not cohomological whole algebra, where you would consider just functions, functions on your moduli stack of objects. And you could either work over FQ or work for constructible functions. And this you get this so-called constructible whole algebra, or if you upgrade it to constructible category, then you get this so-called geometric whole algebra that were considered by Ringel or Lustig. And they are known to produce quantum groups and so on. I'll come back to that later on. Um, but now COHAS, cohomological whole algebras, appear if you try to do something a little bit different, you want to actually consider homology or child group or K-theory or any other oriented more homology theories and maybe some other more fancy stuff. And they would give you uh, various flavors of these cohomological whole algebra. So Koha, Eha, Keha, Obamas, you could call them, OBM, you know, in, in remembrance of good times. And uh, these were defined, so I'm, I'm making it, look like it's easy, but actually each uh, cohomology theory uh, requires some, some work. The precise context in which you are working uh, matters. And so there are a bunch of people that have worked out 
various versions of these uh, kohas. So I'm writing a list of some of them, not all of them probably, but okay. So it's, it's one thing to define these kohas. I think it's, it's another to actually compute them. And um, so I want to make a, a list of uh, some guiding principles uh, that, that you can use in trying to understand these, these kohas. Uh, so first, uh, whole algebras. Let's let's start at the usual whole algebra. So as I said, and and these guiding principles are mostly when t is equal to one, so associated to quivers or or curves. Um, so the whole algebras look like something like a quantum group. More precisely, it's one half of a quantum group, positive half of of a quantum group, associated to certain Lie algebra. That's something like a reductive, infinite dimensional but reductive type. Lie algebra. Uh, that's a very famous discovery of Ringel. Um, then another famous discovery uh, of uh, several several people, including uh, Kapranov, is that uh, whole algebras of derived equivalent categories correspond to the same quantum group. So it's some kind of uh, invariant of the derived category. But the little caveat here is that they might correspond to different halves. And that's actually very important. Uh, and this is an actual theorem by uh, Tim Kramer. Um, so again, this requires uh, to be in D equals one situation. And then a little bit less famous, but I think very useful guiding principle is that suppose you start with your category A, which is of global dimension one, a quiver curve. And then you cook up another category B, which will be of global dimension two this time, but whose uh, moduli stack is the cotangent or maybe truncated or whatever, cotangent stack of MA. So MB is cotangent of MA. Then the uh, koha of B, so the cohomological Hall algebra, you can cook out of this, this uh, moduli stack, which looks like you know, coherent sheaves on the surface, will look like affinizations of the whole algebra, the usual whole algebra of A. So this is this um, uh, guiding principle. And you might wonder why you get an affinization. And this is in some sense because if you look at just functions or um, perverse sheaves, constructible sheaves, you will miss the automorphism group of the objects. You will miss the stacky structure, which is detected uh, when you consider homology, equivariant homology or, or K theory. Um, okay, so I want to give some illustrations of this principle. Uh, and uh, what better place to start than uh, the old, good old case of quivers? So um, let, let us start with QR quiver and consider a, um, A to be the category of representation of this quiver. This is a global dimension one category. And um, so the numerics that will be important in order to understand what Lie algebra lies behind and what quantum group lies behind is this uh, famous Katz polynomial. So uh, Katz associated to any quiver and any dimension vector alpha, a, a certain polynomial, which was later proved to be positive integral, which uh, counts over a finite field, the number of absolutely indecomposable representations. So it's a polynomial in the size of the finite field. And um, so what happens when you consider whole algebra of functions and to get a better picture, you have to consider uh, M over FQ. So counting FQ points of your moduli stack of representation of the quiver and making a whole algebra out of that. Uh, well, you will see that what, is, uh, what has been considered, well, the first thing that was considered is the so-called spherical whole algebra. So it's not the full whole algebra, it's a, it's a sub piece generated by skyscraper sheaves, uh, skyscraper functions of uh, simple objects. And this turns out to be uh, UQ plus of GQ where GQ is the Katsmudi algebra associated to your quiver. And UQ plus is the, the positive half, the, the standard Katsmudi positive half of the corresponding quantum group. And in terms of Katz polynomials, uh, 
a famous uh, theorem of uh, famous conjecture of Katz, which was proved by uh, Tamash Hausel, is that the character of this uh, uh, Katz, uh, Katz Moody Lie algebra is given by the constant term of the Katz polynomial. So, um, okay. Now, what happens if you get, uh, if you are interested in the entire whole algebra, not just the spherical part? Then uh, I want to write, it's a little bit cheating, but I want to say that this is the, again, positive half, standard Katsumudi positive half um, of a, a bigger algebra, which is this G tilde Q. And uh, this bigger Lie algebra is, is actually not a Katsumudi algebra anymore, it's a Borchert algebra. The Carton matrix for this Borchert algebra is infinite, and it counts cuspidal functions, so cuspidal elements in the whole algebra. So I don't want to dwell too long on that, but um, essentially you can prove by some general result that, that was done by Sevenhunt and Vandenberg uh, that uh, the whole algebra is a Borchert algebra, and then uh, the generators, the simple roots for this big Borchardt's algebra are almost by definition cuspidal elements. And, and then you can also prove that uh, the character of this G tilde Q is given by the full Katz polynomial. Um, and not, not just uh, the constant term. So this is a very nice uh, upgrade of Katz conjecture which includes now the full Katz polynomial. If you look at the full whole algebra, you get the full Katz polynomial. Um, okay, and just um, to keep you motivated, if you're more uh, geometry-minded, this uh, G tilde Q is, uh, is expected to be the moleko kunkov lie algebra associated to Q, which is constructed uh, using uh, nakajima Quiver varieties. Um, okay. So this was the whole algebra in the case of a quiver. Now let's, uh, let's look at the cohomological whole algebras for this quiver. So um, when I start with A being the representation of my quiver, then this B, which uh, uh, gives the cotangent to the stack of representation of the quiver is this so-called pre-projective algebra. So I'm not going to define it. We, we don't really need what it, what it precisely is. I just want to state that uh, MB is something like T star of MA. And it has the nice property that it's a CY2, essentially CY2. You can embed it into a CY2. As I said, it's global dimension two. And if we look at its uh, cohomological whole algebra, uh, in homology, and in K-theory, you need to involve uh, work of um, um, Padurario, which we will speak about tomorrow. Um, you can uh, relate this uh, full koha to, again, some enveloping algebra or some deformation of uh, the Yangian of a certain Lie algebra. Uh, this, uh, so which means it's a, it's a deformation of the enveloping algebra of the uh, loops, positive loops, into some uh, certain Lie algebra, which is called the BPS Lie algebra. So this first result was proved by Davison and Meinhardt. And you can compute the character of this BPS Lie algebra. And you see that it's the same character as this uh, Borchardt's algebra. So it's again given by the full Katz polynomial. So just numerically, you can check that uh, from the whole algebra, you get uh, a certain um, big Lie algebra, this G tilde Q. And from the cohomological whole algebra, you get the same uh, Lie algebra, at least at the level of characters, uh, except that uh, the koha is the Yangian of this Lie algebra, instead of just the enveloping algebra of that Lie algebra. And you can guess the conjecture. It says that. Um, well, the, the BPS Lie algebra is the same as the Molik, as this G tilde Q, this big Borchardt's algebra, and it's the same as this Molikov Lie algebra. So, as far as I know, um, these are not, there are three things you want to equate, and they're, they're, it's not, not um, known, at least to me, that this is the case. Um, 
Okay, so you can uh, easily guess from here what you expect from this k-theoretic whole algebra. Uh, it's like passing from um, uh, C to C star. And so um, you instead expect to get the quantum loop algebra of G tilde Q. But this is still uh, also conjectural. Um, OK, so there are some remarks. Why are these whole algebras interesting in the first place? Because one can prove that they act on the cohomology of Nakajima quiver varieties. So it's well known that the Katsumudi algebra, or the loop Katsumudi algebra, acts on the cohomology of Nakajima quiver variety. But actually, uh, what really acts is this uh, G tilde Q. So it gives you something uh, bigger than you expect. Um, OK. What is my favorite example? Favorite example is the CY example, Calabi-Yau example. So you start with Q being the Jordan quiver. Then the representation of Q, you can think of it geometrically as torsion sheaves on A1. And the whole algebra of Q is, um, is known to be isomorphic to uh, UQ plus of GL1 hat, so the quantum Heisenberg algebra, positive half of quantum Heisenberg algebra. Um, yes. And what is the representation of the preprojective algebra? Well, this is, again, uh, torsion sheaves, but now on A2. And the koha of this is known to be the affine Yangian of GL1, which is exactly what you expect. Or it could also be called the Yangian of GL1 hat. Um, and in this uh, k-theoretical version, what you get is, um, you could say, the quantum loop algebra of GL1 hat. Uh, which is this so-called uh, elliptic hole algebra. And what is nice about this elliptic hole algebra, and I will, I'm mentioning this because I want to um, use it a bit later on, is that uh, there's an action of SL2Z. Or maybe more precisely, if you want to include the central character, uh, there's an action of the braid group, B3, um, on this uh, elliptic hole algebra as algebra automorphisms. Um, OK, so this is an example of useful uh, algebras. So they've been used in certain uh, um, study of moduli space, numerical invariance, enumerative geometry of moduli spaces of sheaves on surfaces by a bunch of people that I, I uh, listed here. Uh, Negutz has a bunch of papers on these in particular, uh, and, a, and a generalization of this picture. Um, OK, so this was my uh, illustration in the context of quivers. Now I want to move to the context of, of uh, curves. And one reason to do this is especially this last uh, calabi yau example. So um, Olivia, I have a question. Sure. Your coherent shifts are they supposed to be supported at the origin. It's just a matter of renormalization, but here I, I pretended they're not. Yes, and I'm looking at. Uh, uh, Quite. Yes. yes. So this GL one here would be starting degree two, maybe. But um, yes, I, I this this is the heuristic part, but I'm so I'm not being very precise about in which degrees the generators live. Um, okay. Any other question? All right. Um, OK, so uh, why am I interested in these kohas, or k-has, especially this one? It's because, uh, as I said, it, it, it uh, encodes um, pointwise modifications on the surface. So you modify a sheaf on the surface by a torsion sheaf at a point, if you modify it pointwise. And this is the algebra that kind of encodes all the uh, modifications uh, the algebra of modifications, the Hecke operators of modifications of your coherent sheaf at a point. And uh, white might, one might also be interested in understanding what happens when you modify your coherent sheaf along a curve. 
And this is exactly where this um, cohas of uh, curves will appear. So, um, okay, so now I forget about quivers and I consider the case of coherent sheaves on a curve where X is smooth projective of genus G, this is still uh, in dimension one. And in this case, um, the category B, which will give the cotangent to the moduli stack of coherent sheaves is going to be the, the Higgs category, category Higgs sheaves. Okay, so um, let me give some examples of uh, usual whole algebras first, and then I will state natural conjectures for the cohomological whole algebras of these um, of these categories. So um, when x is equal to p1, it's an old theorem of Kapranov and Bowman Cassel that this uh, spherical whole algebra uh, is the positive half of uh, SL2 hat. Now here there's a little um, subtle point, important subtle point is that this positive half here is this uh, Dreenfeld positive half. It's not the standard positive half. So I will come back to this in the second part of the talk, but it's important to point that it's not the usual positive half. And if instead of considering the spherical whole algebra, you consider the entire whole algebra, which is something that I'm doing here, then you get UQ plus of GL2 hat. So you add one more generator in the carton, and because it represents the H2 of P1, uh, then it is in degree two. Um, okay, so this is already a nice fact about uh, what uh, uh, coherent sheaves on P1 have to do with quantum loop algebras. Uh, now, if we move to the elliptic curve, then um, I look at the spherical whole algebra. And uh, this is known to give this elliptic whole algebra. This is where the name comes from. And this also explains why this SL2Z is acting, because SL2Z or the break group is the derived group of, is inside the group of derived auto equivalences of an elliptic curve. Um, okay. And then if you want to consider just, not just the spherical whole algebra, but the entire whole algebra, then you have to take a bunch of copies of this elliptic whole algebra and as many as the cohomology of the, of the curve. And this is a work of uh, Fratzila. Um, okay, and then when G is bigger than one, um, all I can offer is some vague conjecture. Again, it should be some um, deformation of a certain, um, so the quantum group of some uh, Lie algebra G tilde G. And this Lie algebra here, um, should really be thought of as an object in the category of GSP2G modules. Why is that? It's because there is um, a choice for the curve. So the uh, before, in the case of quivers, the only thing you could choose if you want is the finite field. If you fix the quiver, the only remaining choice is the finite field. In the case of a curve, you can choose which curve to choose, or which curve to pick. Um, and, and so this choice is reflected in the veil numbers of the curve. And the veil numbers of the curve, you should think of them as a conjugacy class um, of the Frobenius, I mean, as a, as a character of the Frobenius, which is an element in GSP2GC. Um, Would it be able to take a break fairly shortly, Olivia? Is this a natural? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right here. I have one more minute. I'm going to yeah. rush like I've been doing since the beginning, unless you stop me. No, no, carry on. <laughs> um, so, okay, so all I want to say is that there is a certain Lie algebra, G tilde G, that I don't really know. But I expect that um, the whole algebra is just a quantum envelope algebra of that Lie algebra. And it should be a Lie algebra in the category of GSP2G modules. Um, okay, so. What do we expect? We expect that uh, the cohomological whole algebra of the category of Higgs sheaves on X, uh, so that really corresponds to modification on the surface uh, along a curve. That would be X embedded into the surface. You expect that this is the uh, affine Yangian of G tilde G. 
And in the K-theoretic setup, you expect that is the quantum loop algebra of G tilde G. Um, okay, and, and what plays the role of these quantum parameters? Now, uh, again, there are G plus one parameters, not just the one as there were before. Uh, it's because we have equivariant parameter, which is the usual one, dilation along the fibers. I take the cotangent stack of something, so I have always uh, the C star acting along the fibers. But uh, here I also can consider the action of the mapping class group on, on, these, um, on these cohas. And, um, and actually the quotient acts. So this is where you, you recover this SP2GC. In the, in the usual whole algebra business, it was veil numbers. And in this uh, coha, coha business, it's just the action of the mapping class group. Um, OK, I think I can stop here. It's supposed to be lighter. Yeah, so the second part is supposed to be a little bit lighter, I hope. I hope I will uh, succeed. Um, OK, so as I said, um, it's, it's, it's one thing to define the algebra. It's another to actually compute them. It's also one thing to guess what, what the answer should be. And it's, it's uh, also another to actually uh, work out the computation. Um, so the um, first case in this context of curves, uh, first uh, case that you want to consider is just the case of genus zero, so P1. So I take X to be P1, and A is my category of coherent sheaves on P1, and B is the category of Higgs sheaves on P1. And I will just work with uh, Borel-Mohr homology and actually T equivariant borel mohr homology. So as I said, I always have the C star that acts along the fibers um, of this cotangent bundle map. Uh, and then I also have another C star, which is a loop rotation because I'm on P1. So I have two C stars. And um, there's this uh, cohomological whole algebra of Higgs sheaves on P1 uh, is uh, vibrated, the rank and the degree. And there are two equivariant parameters, epsilon one, epsilon two, and let me just denote this by y plus. So, um, because the function whole algebra, as we saw, is uq of gl2 hat, uh, we expect uh, y plus to be related to the affine Yangian of gl2 or sl2. So, I'm using the notation sl2 here because it's a uh, notation that is used in the literature. But really, I think that for affine Yangians, there's no difference between SL2 and GL2, or maybe a one-dimensional difference. That would be kind of irrelevant. Um, OK, so this is just according to the philosophy that I described before, where in the case where B is something like the cotangent stack to A, um, and so we expect this uh, koha to be the loop algebra of the koha of A. Koha of B is the loop algebra of the whole algebra of A. So, OK, so um, a few words about what this affine Yangian of SL2 is, actually. Um, so it's given by some generators and relations. And the generators are the EIL, HIL, FIL, where I is 0, 1, because SL2 had, is this uh, rank 2 Katsumodili algebra. And L greater or equal to zero stands for this uh, loop parameter. So you should think that EIL looks a little bit like, oops, let me try to do this. EIL is something like, um, so it would be E S power L if I is say one, <laughs> and it would be F S power L plus one if i is 0, right? Inside uh, sl2 hat bracket s. Um, what am I saying? Yes. Uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry.
this is f t where sl2 hat is sl2 t t minus one okay and here i'm just considering um yes and you can guess what f is so here i'm just considering uh, y plus to be the positive half of this uh, affine yangian so it's the so-called katsmudi positive half i'm taking loops positive loops with values in the katsmudi half um, okay so there are two interesting subalgebras inside this affine yangian first of all there is the usual non-deformed u of sl2 hat um, which is when you take all the modes to be zero uh, and actually this should be just a positive half uh, up. And, um, and then you can also take a certain algebra of operators, which is the adjoint action by this uh, loop carton. So I want to use this in order to generate y out of y0 plus. So you can think, let me, let me try to go artistic here. You can think that, um, so here I have my plane, SL2 plane. So I have my root system. Okay, these are my three three roots for three lines of roots for SL2 hat. And then I have this uh, S direction. Uh, that goes like this. And H tends to move you up, right? Acting by H moves you up in this S direction. So H up moves you up. And so H applied to Y0, Y0 is this ground floor. So H applied to Y0 generates Y. It has, it's a subspace that generates the entire Yangian. And so uh, the theorem that's joined with uh, Vasro and that is still in progress, to be honest, uh, good progress, but still in progress, is that uh, this affine, this koha, this uh, koha B, this, so this Y plus, bold Y plus, um, is isomorphic to the subalgebra of Y generated by uh, H, but this time not uh, Y0 plus, so maybe I should say Y plus, so H, I should have added it's H, applied to Y0 plus, generates Y plus. So instead of this, we uh, want to take, instead of the usual Y0 plus, we want to take this Drinfeld positive half. <laughs> so uh, if I really try to go artistic, I would say instead of, yeah, let me not try to go artistic, but instead of uh, taking uh, a certain positive half in this uh, base plane, ground floor, I take the loop positive half. So it's some kind of uh, double loop subalgebra. Um, so a corollary of this is that Y plus contains two copies of this affine Yangian of GL1. And also uh, for any K in Z, Y plus contains a copy of uh, this usual Yangian of SL2. So let me try to uh, describe um, how this works. So this is the projection to this Y0 plane, if you want. Um, and so for any uh, integral slope, I can restrict my koha to the semi-stable Higgs sheaves of a certain slope. And this category of semi-stable Higgs sheaves will give me uh, just a, a usual copy of uh, Yangian of SL2. And then if I restrict to uh, torsion Higgs sheaves, then uh, what I will get are two copies because H star of P1 is of dimension two, two copies of this affine Yangian of GL1 hat. So I'm kind of gluing two copies of the affine Yangian of GL1 hat along a whole family of affine, of Yangians, usual Yangians of SL2. Um, okay, so in the case of a K-theoretical whole algebra, you can uh, expect a similar picture. 
Now you have to replace this affine yang yin that is sitting in this vertical line by this elliptic hole algebra. And actually, uh, uh, the presentation that is uh, good in these terms was found in this case by uh, two physicists, uh, Munzer and Ziggers. Um, so what I want to um, point out also is that there are two copies of this uh, affine yang yin of GL1 hat. And uh, this is why it should be called GL2 instead of uh, SL2, because these two copies are really the uh, double loops in the carton, right? And the diagonal matrices, you take double loops. And this gives you two subalgebras. And, um, and so why this should be interesting is that now we can have a precise statement that uh, y of SL2 hat, at least we know exactly what is the, and how this Lie algebra, this affine Yangin of SL2 hat, should act by modification along P1s, embedded P1s on some curves inside some surfaces. <laughs> so you can think of ALE spaces and, and things like this. Um, okay, so a few more minutes. How much time do I have left? 10 minutes? 13 minutes, huh? Okay. Sorry, a little bit more than 10 minutes. Um, okay, perfect. Um, so let me just say a few words about the idea of the proof. Um, so not very surprisingly, we want to use this derived equivalence. So we have derived equivalence between coherent sheaves on P1 and representations of this Konecker quiver. And in this case, it's known um, that the... Um, uh, cohomological whole algebra of the Konecker quiver, I mean, of the pre projective algebra of the Konecker quiver, is the usual positive half of this affine Yang in a vessel 2 hat. So uh, we want to uh, understand how this, what this tilting equivalence does at the level of Kohas. So, how we do this? Well, we do it uh, in some kind of uh, taking a suitable limit. So um, if you look at this picture, uh, this part here is the Katsmudi positive half of, of the ground floor. And this is the Drinfeld positive half of the ground floor. And to go from one to the other, I apply a certain break group element, a lattice a generator of the lattice part of the uh, extended break group of uh, SL2 hat, I mean uh, S2 hat. Affine S2. Um, that, uh, so this, this break group element, it, it uh, sends uh, things in the negative half up and things in the positive half down, and it preserves all the things in the carton loop. And so we want to understand um, how to implement this kind of limit. So, um, in, uh, in, so algebraically, we can do this. <laughs> in this affine yang yin using a break group action that was built recently by Codera. So the Codera showed that the break group acts on this affine yang yin of SL2. And we want to take some kind of limit. So this is kind of clear algebraically what we want to do. And uh, geometrically, what we want to do is we want to uh, relate again these kohas uh, for uh, rep q, I mean, rep PQ and uh, Higgs P1 um, using some BGP kind reflection functors. So uh, let me recall for you the, the structure of this so-called auslander heighten quiver of uh, P1 and the Konecker quiver. Uh, so uh, maybe it's easier to think in terms of coherent sheaves on P1 for some people, maybe better for others to think in representations of this Konecker quiver, but let's do it for P1. You have all the classes of line bundles. These are all the classes of line bundles. So this could, could be, uh, yeah, maybe this could be O, O of one, O of two, O of three, and so on, O of minus one, O of minus two. And here you have the torsion sheaves, which come in families, and they're non-rigid objects. Um, so this is one heart of this derived category, which corresponds to coherent sheaves on P1. And then another heart of this derived category, corresponding to representation of this uh, Konecker quiver, 
Here you have the so-called pre-projective component. Here you have the regular component, and here you have the pre-injective component. And we want to pass from one to the other. So, um, well, we we can use this. Uh, um, we have this um, BGP reflection functor, or we can use, uh, if you prefer, tensoring by O of one or O of minus one. Uh, that acts in the following way. So it, it pushes on this side, and and it takes some of this side. So uh, you see that in the limit, indeed, if you apply this to rep Q uh, enough times, then you, you would, in the limit, converge to Koch P1. OK, so we have some nice process at the level of categories, therefore, at the level of stacks, and by functoriality at the level of Kohas. And then we have one nice thing, which is algebraically, in terms of this break group action. And so we have to equate the two. So we have to show that the action of this BGP functor on the Koha is the same. That this is a, a geometric action of the BGP functors is the same as the algebraic one. So you have to make this a little bit more precise. Um, so maybe I, because I'm, I'm slightly um, running a little bit out of time, let me just say that, um, yeah, let me not describe this diagram in too much details, but um, why is it not obvious? It's, it's not obvious because um, in essence, what this means is that you're going to look at certain open substacks of the stack of, say, representation, the pre-projective algebra. And, um, and you want to show that um, certain subquotients of this uh, whole algebras are mapped onto each other by the action of these break group elements. And uh, the problem is that these uh, open substacks do not have algebra structures. So you cannot, they don't have a canonical algebra structure. This is a difference between the usual whole algebra and this Koha, is that these open subsects do not possess a natural uh, Koha structure. Um, OK, so here's the conjecture that you can write for any quiver. Um, and I want to um, say that there, this is very analogous. So people who are used to working with canonical bases will notice that uh, statements like this saying that the BGP functor essentially um, descends at the level of whole algebra to so this break group operators. This is a well-known result uh, of Lustig. So Lustig proved that they were um, compatible with canonical bases. And the BGP functors are, uh, because they're geometric enough, they're compatible with canonical bases. So, um, so in the context of usual whole algebra, this theorem is a well-known result of Lustig. Uh, something that's a little bit closer is in the case of, in the context of semi-canonical bases and functions on this, uh, constructible functions on this uh, pre-projective, uh, nilpotent pre-projective stack. Uh, now this is a theorem of Bowman. And um, somehow we managed to prove this conjecture if Q is a finite type and a weak form of this conjecture, which is enough for us, if Q is of affine type. Um, okay, so if you if you do this, this is the kind of uh, essential step that allows you to uh, deal with each of these uh, operations, action by T and, and one PGP functor, and then you have to take the limit in a suitable way, but that's not so difficult. Okay, um, so I have a few more minutes. Uh, I want to say a few words about what we want to do next. Um, so there are two natural directions in which you could go. Uh, one is go from uh, this uh, Konecker quiver to any affine quiver. And now uh, this could be useful to study um, maybe some kind of AGT type of type enumeration problems uh, for sheaves on ALE spaces or uh, resolution of uh, Kleinian singularities. Because now this uh, Kohas would um, encode the action of modification along P1s, and maybe even along chains of P1s. So you could imagine that this can also be useful 
in the more general context where you have uh, Calabi-Yau uh, two or three and certain divisors, uh, hyperplanes maybe, and you want to understand modifications along these hyperplanes. Um, so this is one of the main motivations for studying these, these cohorts of curves. But then there's just this object that I really wonder about is what happens when you move from um, coherent sheaves on P1 to coherent sheaves on an elliptic curve? Then if you follow the same uh, logic, uh, if you fix a uh, uh, slope, any rational number, then um, what you get is something like torsion sheaves on this elliptic curve. And if you consider the cohomology of a whole algebra of torsion sheaves on a curve, what you get is something like this uh, elliptic whole algebra. So it would mean that the um, cohomological whole algebra of Higgs sheaves on an elliptic curve would contain a bunch of, of uh, affine Yangians or elliptic whole algebras, one for every uh, slope. And, um, and altogether, you expect that they would generate some kind of uh, Yangian deformation of the enveloping algebra of uh, what some people call triple loop algebra, or I think it's much nicer, pagoda algebra. So I found this in some paper of Mironov Morozov Zenkiewicz, some, some physicists who kind of expected that such an algebra would appear in some context that are just a sequence of letters and words for me, unfortunately. Uh, numbers, letters and numbers. Six, there's a six somewhere, 6D six something. Um, okay, and just to finish, uh, so the elliptic whole algebra has an action of SL2Z, if you remember well. So along each of these uh, slopes, for every slope, you get an action of SL2Z. But then looking at this picture, it's obvious that there is also a global action of SL2Z, which permutes this horizontal plane. And so altogether, you expect that they generate some SL3Z. So I expect that this calabi setup is the nicest one and should produce some some uh, big Lie algebra, this pagoda type Lie algebra that has a SL3Z symmetry, maybe some great break group version of this SL3Z. But uh, all the techniques that we have so far, this relation to quivers, this is not, not going to cut it. Uh, we need some more ideas to, to try to understand precisely what this algebra is. Okay, so uh, thank you all. I am sure I was very, very, very quick. Um, but at least you can look at the notes. Okay, thank you very much, Olivier. Um, <coughs> our remote applause, our mute applause is happening now. Um, right. Do people have any questions? Um, I'll, I'll try and rapidly unmute people as they do. Yeah, I, I, I have some uh, kind of question related to my previous question. Uh, uh, so, uh, okay, if we uh, if we stick to to the surface uh, as a um, cotangent bundle to the curve, which is kind of uh, geometry uh, underlying, uh, of you, you have said, uh, you can think of this cotangent. Um, the total space of this cotangent bundle uh, mm, as a divisor uh, in something three-dimensional. Yeah, of mm -hmm. course, uh, the whole thing is a three-dimensional story, but you can look infinitesimally. You can mm, kind of uh, mm, think that you have this cotangent bundle with certain multiplicity. Okay. Uh, and so, what what will be the corresponding coha? Um, well, I would guess it would be related to that one. Uh, yeah, but the question is, uh, in what way? Yeah, it should be, but it's it's not really kind of, it's not really something three-dimensional. You do not need to use a sheaf of vanishing cycles at first glance, but uh, uh, on the other hand, it's not purely two-dimensional because uh, um, you can think that you have uh, a third variable like x, y uh, uh, for for the uh, for your surface and the variable z, which which is nilpotent. So then it's right, a mixture between two. 
there is one paper. The one paper I know about that you you wrote with uh, several people. Uh, yeah, people, but I'm not uh, satisfied with it. This is why, why I'm asking you. Yeah, I, I'm not satisfied. Um, yeah, I don't. I I. So you could you could try to um, uh, relate, say, torsion sheaves with rank n sheaves on the surface, something like that. Right. This is what you're saying. Torsion sheaves on this uh, threefold supported on this divisor could try to relate it to higher rank sheaves on the surface and do this mm -hmm. Koha business there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't have a better answer. Sorry. Mm, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there's another question just asking how the spherical Hall algebra is defined, Louis. Uh, ah. oh. Which one? Uh, representation of quiver or uh, or uh, coherent sheaves on the curve? Let I'm me just... do both. Yes. <laughs> so uh, spherical Hall algebra of the quiver is the subalgebra generated by the uh, characteristic function of simple objects. This is a yeah. simple representation of yeah. Q. Uh. Olivia, maybe I have one more question. Uh, so when when you uh, speak about uh, um, Higgs shifts, so basically uh, geometrically this means that you have a cotangent bundle and the compact spectral curves. Now, if uh, that's really a thing which I'm interested in because we are doing this stuff with Roma Fedorov and my son. Uh, if you uh, consider a Higgs uh, bundles or shifts with singularities, for example, uh, like parabolic Higgs bundles, so then it's no longer cotangent bundle. And it's no longer, uh, for example, for, for the regular singularities, it's no longer um, uh, Calabi-Yau, because it's not the cotangent bundle. Fractional, it's fractional it's, it's a total space of, of, of the canonical shift uh, twisted by the divisor. Yeah. If, right, 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 right. Uh, uh, yeah. And <laughs> what to do then? I mean, uh, is your... Uh, um, uh, well, can, can your construction be uh, upgraded? I would guess so. Uh, yeah, I would too, but what, I would what guess kind so, of but I haven't, I, haven't, uh, I haven't studied that. But So one, the first thing you could do is parabolic P1s. And in some cases, this would be, um, again, affine quiver. So for parabolic P1s of finite type, I'm pretty sure it's the same same answer. This this formalism will work um, because you can already, also relate it to quivers. Mm -hmm. But uh, for uh, for the others, I would guess it should work, but I haven't I haven't uh, studied that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I can I can uh, finish answering this question. So it's generated by the simples, and at least if Q is acyclic, you can also say it's generated by the constant function on each of these components, M D, D in N I. So maybe this gives a, a better a better uh, motivation. It's, it's whatever is generated by the constant functions on all these moduli stuff. When you multiply them, you get some more complicated things, but you don't get everything in general. And if you're on a curve, then you can do the same thing. It's generated by one RD. Well, maybe again, it's the same. Constant functions on all uh, RD, where R is greater or equal to zero and D is in Z. So again, constant, uh, connected components of the moduli stack. You take the constant functions and see what they generate. Okay, great. Well, um, let's uh, 
let's finish there and, and thank Olivia again.